Photoshop's been the industry standard for artists and designers alike for decades now, adding new and improved features literally every year. This is great for those of us who've been using it for those years, but it can be a lot to take in for someone just getting into the digital art world or for someone who just doesn't have time to constantly keep up. If you don't know, I'm Abby Esparza and I've been a working digital artist for about 10 years now, and I've picked up a thing or two in those 10 years and made a list of my top 10 essential design tips and tools for Photoshop. Focusing on a speedier workflow, a good practices, aka good habits to start now uh, so you don't have to break the bad habits later, and the tools I just think every Photoshop user should be using. All resources featured today can be found over on Envato Elements where you can get unlimited downloads of graphics, photos, and fonts, millions of creative digital assets with simple commercial licensing. And we're going to set the mood with a big one, use adjustment layers and other non-destructive editing techniques. So first, let's talk about adjustment layers specifically. Adjustment layers carry image adjustment settings, applying those settings to any layer located below that adjustment layer. This includes uh, tonal and color adjustments along with fills like gradient or pattern fill layers. So why use adjustment layers then? Firstly, adjustment layers are just excellent for applying that same adjustment setting uh, to multiple different layers. So let's say you have a background consisting of five different layers and you want to bump up the contrast of all five. Add a curves layer over top those five layers and pop in an S curve that you're done. You can edit, adjust and readjust adjustment layers without ever permanently affecting your pixel layers. And then you also get all of the advantages that standard layers have like opacity settings, layer modes and being able to easily rearrange, duplicate or delete a layer making your workflow much more flexible, uh, practicing what's called non-destructive editing. Non-destructive editing is a way of editing pixel-based layers without ever directly changing those pixels. Where destructive editing uh, makes direct edits to the photo, permanently changing the pixels. Several different tools in Photoshop will help you edit non-destructively, and we will be covering some of those other tools coming up, uh, so keep on watching. But first, let's take a look at one of the many ways I like to use adjustment layers, which is to create color grades. You'll see a folder of adjustment layers on many of my edits right at the top of that layer stack. Sometimes it's just some slight changes to contrast and color, but other times these layers completely transform the whole image. I stack one on top of another uh, using all available layer settings, including opacity, blend modes, and even layer style settings like blend if. And of course, things like layer masks, so more on those coming up. But thanks to these being adjustment layers, I can come back into this PSD and change or completely delete that color grade. I can make changes to the primary composite without redoing the color grade. This is huge if you're someone who needs to be able to make a multiple quick revisions to any given image. And I could also copy this whole color grade folder and drop it into another PSD if I wanted to. Maybe you have multiple images in the same series and want that color grade to stay consistent. This is just one way I utilize adjustment layers though. I will almost always choose an adjustment layer over image adjustment, almost. We'll cover when I might not in a moment, but first let's move on to number two. Use both layer masks and clipping masks. Another non-destructive editing tool, layer masks are an alternative to a permanently erasing part of a layer, hiding the pixels as opposed to deleting them. They work by adding a mask to a layer or group, then you use black to hide parts of that layer and white to reveal, with varying shades of gray working like different opacity levels. And you can use more than just the brush tool on a layer mask, including smudge and blur tools. I actually use both those tools to soften the edges of layer masks so they better match the image's edge being masks. Uh, most edges are slightly blurry if you ever <laughs> look real close. And along with the different pixel brushes, you can use selection tools to create or edit masks. This brings us to one of the most common uses for layer masks, extracting subjects and objects from their original background. So why use layer masks as opposed to just deleting? Like with adjustment layers, using layer masks give you the flexibility to make changes and edits to your layers without ever committing to any one decision. It also lets you spot treat while using adjustment and fill layers, which both come with a layer mask by default. 
Photoshop just assumes you're going to be needing them. When I'm first planning out a composite, gathering my stock images and figuring out the general composition of things, I actually like to do really quick and sloppy extractions. Then when I have a clear idea of where I'm going and what images work and where they work, I go back and refine or just completely redo those layer masks. This saves me from wasting tons of time extracting objects or subjects that I just won't be using in the end. But while extracting images is a massive use case for layer masks, you'll use them on almost every layer type from pixel to adjustment and even shapes and text. Really, anytime you want to erase or remove something, but not commit to actually removing or deleting it. Which will be pretty often if you're following good non-destructive editing practices. Then what about clipping masks? A clipping mask is when you clip one layer inside of another. The pixels of the bottom layer become the new boundaries for the top layer. The top layer is the clipped layer and the bottom layer is the uh, clipping mask. The mask is the boundaries of that layer. You create a clipping mask by holding Alt between the two layers you want to clip, right on the line break separating the two layers, and then clicking. Your mouse will show an icon of a square with an arrow pointing downwards. Clipping masks are great for painting highlights, shadows, or details onto any one specific layer. Anytime you don't want one layer spilling onto other layers, essentially. They're also great when you want to use an adjustment layer, but only have it affect that one specific layer, not all the layers underneath it. You can clip any kind of layer into any other type of layer, and you can clip layers into groups. However, you cannot clip groups into layers, and you can only nest clipped layers once. So suppose I have several layers clipped into another layer. In that case, I can't then clip that bottom layer, which is our clipping mask currently, into another layer and it remain a clipping mask. The new bottom layer will become the boundary for all layers clipped into it, including the previous clipping mask. Whatever the bottom layer is, that's gonna be your clipping mask. But what if we wanted to take this subject, full of lighting effects clipped into her, and then clip her into a shape? We could select all her layers and right click merge layers, but that would be incredibly destructive. Instead, we could use tip number three, preserve everything using smart objects. Basically, anything that isn't a layer that I want to actively paint on, I turn into a smart object, especially if it's an image layer, a stock image layer, for instance. So what are smart objects though? A smart object is a layer that references the original pixels on a layer, but never permanently edits those pixels. So any edits that you apply to a smart object can be undone or adjusted, making smart objects kind of the ultimate non-destructive tool. You can turn any layer into a smart object by choosing the layer and then right click convert to smart object. And when you're going to use smart objects, just depends. It's gonna be pretty often. Let's start with the most obvious use case, which is retaining the full resolution information of an image after adjusting its size. Meaning you can convert an image into a smart object at its full resolution, shrink it down, and then enlarge it again. There will be no loss of quality or blurriness because it can still reference that image's original data. Even cooler though, once an image is a smart object, you can then apply both adjustments and filters to them non-destructively. Filters added to a smart object become what's known as smart filters that can then be edited at any time. So if you add a filter Gaussian blur and then realize you want less of that blur, double click the filter name under the smart object and adjust the settings. This can be done at any time without worrying about undo or history states. You can also delete a filter completely or temporarily hide it. And arrange the order of the filters after they've been added, because the arrangement of your smart filters do matter. If you add some filter noise to an image and then a Gaussian blur, the noise will become blurred. Drag the noise filter over top that Gaussian blur filter and the noise will now show over top the blur. And the same goes for adjustments, with both filters and adjustments working interactively. So I'll use filter adjustments on a smart object instead of an adjustment layer if I know I won't need to mask it, or if I don't intend to clip anything under that adjustment layer. Though smart filters do have a smart filter mask, 
that works the same as any layer mask. Keep in mind, one mask controls all smart filters on any given layer. And as I mentioned earlier, you can't paint or edit the pixels on a smart object directly, so no brush-based tools without rasterizing the layer first. Single images aren't the only thing that can be changed into a smart object. You can convert multiple layers into one smart object by selecting several layers and then right-click Convert to Smart Object. So if you take our subject and convert her and her clip layers into a smart object, we can now clip her into other layers uh, without compromising her clip layers. We can also add more adjustments and filters to her without ever permanently affecting her previous effects and filters. And most importantly, or to me at least, we can add a new layer mask to her, giving her two masks essentially, one for extracting and one for general designs and edits. This keeps us from accidentally ruining that original mask recreated when extracting her. This is one of my favorite tricks since I put a lot of effort into perfecting my main subject's mask most of the time, and even when it's quick, it's still not the most fun thing about image compositing. No one's like, yeah, I get to extract a bunch of images today. If you ever need to edit or adjust a smart object's original contents, simply uh, double click the smart object to open it, make your changes, save, and then close the smart object. The saved changes will reflect in the original PSD. There are even times when I'm making so many changes to a smart object that I just keep it open, I place it side by side with that main PSD, and then watch the changes become live as I just quick save. You can even turn smart objects into new smart objects, nesting one smart object inside of a, another. And then one last trick that I love doing when it's time to do my final touches, like adjusting in camera raw or maybe adding an iris blur, uh, I'll select every layer and then right click convert to smart object, turning the whole PSD into one giant smart object. Now I can add those final touches, but still adjust the primary composite if I ever needed to, simply by double clicking that smart object. No more reapplying that same camera raw filter over and over every time you need to do some revisions to that main composite. Let's move on to number four, layer styles. Focusing on not just using layer styles, but using them efficiently. I've seen people manually add the same layer style to multiple different layers, one by one, and while the dedication and patience are admirable, there's an easier way. Copying one set of layer styles onto a new layer is actually pretty quick. First, make sure your layer effects are visible and not collapsed. Then hold Alt, click and hold on effects, and drag and drop those effects on top of whatever layer you're copying them onto. And that's it. You can also copy layer effects onto groups. If you have a layer style that you use often, or simply made one that you never want to painstakingly recreate ever again, open the layer styles panel and choose new style. This will save the layer style settings of that layer, but you can also choose to include the layers blending options, which is really nice. And once saved, you can go into styles and use your presets. And while downloading custom fonts and brushes is a well-known practice, I feel like people sometimes underestimate the power of a library full of some solid pre-made layer style effects. Number five, using auto alignment guides and stamping to keep things evenly aligned and balanced. First, let's talk about uh, the auto alignment tools, which can be accessed in the move tools upper options bar. If you have two layers selected, you'll have six different alignment options. You'll also have two additional distribution tools if you have more than three selected. These tools will auto align based on the pixel edges of your layer. So if part of a layer is hidden by a mask, the align tools will snap to that layer's original edge, not the mask's edge. So something to keep in mind. But in general, align tools work excellently in designs with a lot of text and shape elements that need to line up. Poster designs are a great example where precise alignment is incredibly important. Bringing us to guides. There are several ways to create a guide. My favorite is to show the rulers using Control R, and then you can just click and drag on the rulers to place a guide. Clicking and dragging on the top ruler creates a horizontal guide, while the left ruler creates a vertical guide. And then you can switch back and forth between the two uh, using Alt. Guides are super handy for predetermining layouts and ensuring proper alignment. 
but they're also great for setting up a compositional grid, like the rule of thirds, making guides a must for both graphic designers and digital artists alike. So let's talk about snapping. Because while moving around layers on the canvas, you might have noticed your layers have a ten tendency to want to snap and align with other layers and guides. This is called snapping. A snapping is turned on by default, but if you want to double check, you can look at view, snap, and see if it's active by a check mark. And of course, if you don't like the snapping, you can uncheck it. And then you can also choose what will and will not snap by going to snap too. Snap is great for graphic design and typography work, but can be annoying while doing something like a photo compositing. So I do suggest unchecking it while editing your photos and then switching it back on when it's time to add type or anything like that. Number six, use custom brushes. Downloading custom brushes is incredibly easy. Just find a set of pre-made custom brushes, high resolution is always best. Download and drop the ABR file either onto your desktop or more ideally into a dedicated brush folder for a better organization. And then go into the brush panel, click the cog icon and import brushes. I like to have a set of core brushes that I always have installed, I collapsed into nice organized brush groups. Then I keep all of my more specialty brushes in their own folder, where I can re-import them when needed as needed, and then delete them when I'm done. Just to keep the uh, brush panel nice and snappy. But what I actually want to focus on here is creating your own custom brushes, and not even fancy ones. Some of my most used brushes are just different iterations of the default round brush. All of them are different brush settings that I just find myself constantly reapplying or adjusting, which is a huge waste of time and a real momentum killer. So instead of choosing a hard round brush, lowering the hardness to 80%, and then turning off pressure for opacity and the transfer settings, something I used to do all the time, and now I just choose that brush with those saved settings. And while we're talking about brushes and their settings, let's talk about opacity and flow, because I always recommend using flow if you aren't already. Not all the time. It's not a complete replacement for opacity. Let's cover the differences and when you might want to choose one over the other. So let's cover opacity. The opacity value is a percentage of transparency. 100% means a full color stroke and then the lower you go, the less opaque the brush stroke. However, with the flow setting, that controls the speed at which color is laid down. Each brush pass will build more and more color as you go. Unlike opacity, you don't have to lift your brush, making it amazing for gradually building things up like color, light, and shadows. Ultimately, flow is going to give you more control and smoother transitions. You can, of course, combine the two settings. For example, if you want to build up color, but never have it go over 50% opacity before lifting your brush. Once you put your brush back down, then the opacity essentially resets. And it's not just for pen tablet users, don't worry. It works with a mouse just as well. You'll just want to lower the flow rate a bit more as mice are a bit less sensitive than pens. Number seven, how to remove color banding. If you don't know what color banding is, in very simplified terms, color banding happens when values within an image get pushed and pulled so much so there's no longer any color or value information to be shared between the two bands, leaving you with harsh lines of bands that interrupt the tonal transitions in certain parts of your image. Flat colors with gradients over top will suffer the most from color banding, whether it's a handmade background or an image of a clear blue sky. Let's look at how to fix the banding, which luckily can be pretty straightforward. I'm going to try and push the banding to be pretty extreme, just so you can definitely see what I see a bit easier, but you can get varying levels of color banding, from severe to not that big of a deal. Also, sometimes screen recording can actually introduce color banding that isn't actually there, so just something to keep in mind. But my go-to trick for removing it is to try adding in some grain or noise. Adding a tiny amount of noise uh, to a layer can help smooth out the banding. It might not always remove it entirely, but it will reduce it most of the time. I prefer using the grain filter in Camera Raw, applying it to the layer with the banding, not the layer causing the banding, if that makes sense. For solid colors like this, I'll go as high as a grain of 20, but that's because I just kind of like the look of grain. I tend to add it regardless of color banding or not. If the image is smaller, you'd want to go less, and of course, if you just want less grain, you can go as low as you can while still improving that color banding. I like to think of it like this, though. 
color banding kind of always looks terrible, and while most artificial grain won't even be visible in the final version when shared online, and even in some prints. That's why grain is, in my opinion, um, the better option, even if it's not always ideal. And when in doubt, right click convert to smart object, that way you can change the grain later on if you're just not feeling it. And you can also spot treat color banding, only adding noise to the areas that have that banding. Though I do tend to think uh, consistent grain looks better than random patches of noise, but that is entirely up to you, there are no wrong answers there. Number 8. Start creating simple actions. Actions that can create intricate photo effects in a click are super fun. <laughs> but try thinking about the different processes you repeatedly use from project to project, or even multiple times while working on one project. And then make that process into an action. I have three. A one creates a frequency separation group used for skin retouching. The second is used to create the dodge and burn layers I'm constantly creating over and over again. And finally, I have one that simply shrinks and sharpens my image, a process I do when I'm ready to post a photo online. Actions are super easy to create, only taking as long as it takes you to perform the action. Let's press the create new action button in the windows action panel. Now let's recreate my dodge and burn action by creating a curves adjustment and bringing down the shadows. Do remember we're being recorded right now, so if you mess up a step, uh, just reset the action. Next, name that curve burn and invert the layer mask. And now let's create a second curve, bringing up the highlights, naming that layer dodge and again inverting the layer mask. And we can hit stop to finish the action, just that simple. We do want to go through that action and choose any step where we want the settings window to open up for. In this case, we want both of the curve windows to open before moving on to the next step, and this is so we can adjust them image to image. Keep in mind how long it took to create those layers, and now compare it to the 0.5 seconds it takes the action to run. Is it fancy? Nope. Do I use it literally all the time? Absolutely. Coming up is number nine, useful color tools. Uh, these are a few different tips that I decided to just wrap up into one general color tool uh, category. First, it's just to make sure you're using your shortcuts, especially with the color tools. Quickly switch to the eyedropper tool by pressing and holding alt while the brush tool is active. Click and drag to select your color, including dragging anywhere outside of Photoshop, which is super handy. Once you have the color you want, let go of Alt to instantly switch back to the brush tool. You can press X to switch between your foreground and background colors, which is fantastic while masking. And if you do want to revert the background and foreground colors to their default, you can go ahead and hit D. And for my second tip, if you have a set of colors you reach for often, just save them. This is especially helpful when you're designing something that needs consistent colors. You can group them by color type, purpose, or even project, and then when that project is done, you can delete those swatches. I often don't need specific shades of color, still I like to have color swatch groups that kind of achieve specific effects or carry certain color stories. And finally, number 10, which I'm going to call optimizing your layers, but that's just fancy speak for organizing your layers. While organizing your layers does seem like a tedious task and a real workflow killer, it's actually a habit I picked up about three years ago and now recommend everyone do. Basically, your PSD becomes future-proof, where you can open it up a month from now and find the exact image that you don't want to re-extract or a layer style you want to copy. Or maybe the PSD is years old and you'll want to revisit it. Sometimes I'll run into someone wanting to purchase the rights to an old composite of mine, but they need some minor changes to fit their project. Changes that can now be done without an hour of me turning layers on and off, wondering what does what. <laughs> so my personal rule and tip for you is to stop and take a break and group name and color code your layers every hour or two. You can also save some time by only naming the groups. You don't have to name every single layer. But naming a good amount of your layers does make searching by layer name way more practical. 
I like to color code based on what layers are creating what, so all my main subject layers might be green, and that way when I'm looking for my subject layers, I just look for green. Saving me from sitting there squinting and looking for the image and the tiny little layer icon. Bringing us to one little bonus tip, a customize that layer view. You can right click on a layer thumb and choose different layer view options including a layer thumb size and whether or not the layer will clip to the size of the layer's content or the document size. I actually prefer the thumbs clip to what's actually on that layer, just so it's easier to see what's on that thumbnail, but that's entirely personal preference. As is a layer thumb size, I like smaller thumbs since my PSDs typically have a lot of layers, so I like to keep the layer stack as uh, slim as possible. And a secret last tip for all of you who've watched all the way through to the very end, that's why I actually have my layers on the left side of the screen. It just gives you more scrolling space, if you are wondering. And there you have it, folks. My 10 essential design tips and tools for Photoshop. With practicing non-destructive editing really being my biggest tip or piece of advice to give any designer or digital artist. The three pillars being adjustment layers, smart objects, and layer masks because sometimes it's not always about fancy neon and fire effects. Sometimes it's just about setting up personalized and efficient workflows that not only save you time while creating, but mitigates the amount of time you spend of fixing and problem solving, which all artists need to do. Then you can use that time you save to create even more neon glow effects. That's going to do it for today, but if that wasn't enough and you're looking to learn even more, why not check out some of the other excellent videos that Envato Touch Plus has to offer. If you like this video and would like to see more, consider giving us a like and even subscribing if you haven't already. And don't forget to click the little bell icon to be notified of all new videos, including tips, tricks, and of course, tutorials. Happy designing. See you next time.